afternoon and evening already. <clears throat> Would you pick up your hymnals or look at the screen? We're going to be singing It Is Well With My Soul, and it's 7.05 in your book, and we'll do verses 1, 3, and 4. Next hymn is hymn number 305, Jesus Paid It All, and we'll be, doing, be singing verses 1, 3, and 4.
right, Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And I'll get my slides going. We're not turning there. Ephesians chapter number 5. We do have a paper tonight. Thank you, John. <laughs> I appreciate it. This is just a little outline. We're going to cover a lot of ground tonight, okay? And give you a lot of scripture this evening. If you'd like to follow along, fill in a blank outline, you can do that. You don't have to. Uh, I just kind of try to provide that. Some people, it's really they really enjoy that. Some people don't care, and that's fine. But if you'd like one, just uh, let John know. He'll bring you one around. And uh, appreciate him remembering when I forgot. He saw me set those down. He knew I was going to forget. I just know it, but... Uh, Anyway, he's making his way there. And Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be in our, in our Bibles. And as we often remind you, if you don't have your Bible, we will have it on the screen here so you can follow along that way as well. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. What's Ephesians chapter 5 about? Don't look in your Bibles. Tell me what you know in your mind. What's that? The church? <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you just taking a stab, Frank, or you know? <laughs> you looked at the headline. You looked at the title, didn't you? No, he knew. He read Ephesians. Good. All right. Good. I like that answer. All right. It has to do with the church. Uh, it has to do with the marital relationship and the comparison made between that and the church. And so we want to look at that tonight, Ephesians chapter 5. Everybody get an outline that wants one? All right. All right. Ephesians chapter 5 then. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, we only got 10 verses this morning, so why don't you go ahead, or this evening, so why don't you go ahead and stand with me. We'll read, uh, just out of respect for God's word, we'll read uh, verse 22, and then we'll read down through uh, verse 32, and then we'll pray and jump right in uh, to the message this evening. Now, before you men say amen at this verse, okay, chill, all right? <laughs> verse 22, wives, submit yourselves uh, uh, unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That verse has a lot of controversy. That verse has a lot of we don't like, uh, but we're going to explain here in just a minute as we as we talk about the passage, what this truly means. But uh, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Uh, verse 25, uh, did I get that switched? I'm having trouble finding that. Here we go. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives. There we go. That's why we can't get cocky in the first three verses there, man. All right. Uh, love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Uh, for this, this cause, let me make sure I'm switching my thing here. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. And let's pray together tonight, and we'll jump, uh, jump right into the message. Father, we thank you tonight uh, for your love in our lives. Thank you for the uh, time we have to meet here and to be in your house together. Uh, thank you for the time we've had to listen to a missionary's uh, letter, Lord. And we know that uh, on the foreign field, they, they have needs and they have problems and they suffer just like we do here. And Lord, I just pray as a church we'll be sensitive to their needs. I thank you for the time we've had to worship you in, in a couple of songs, Lord, and just lift you up. And uh, thank you for Christ who died on Calvary for us uh, a couple thousand years ago. Lord, we're so, so grateful for that tonight. And Lord, as we open your word now this evening, uh, we thank you that we can be back in your house and start up our Sunday evenings in person again. And we just pray that you'll bless the preaching and the teaching tonight. Uh, may it be helpful to us and encouraging, we pray. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture uh, it, it's a human. Uh, it's an illustration of the the human institution of marriage, thus illustrating the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church, uh, or or his bride. Uh, when we talk about the church, uh, first of all, uh, let's be clear on what the church is. The word church comes from the word ecclesia. Uh, ecclesia simply means a called out assembly. So, who is the church this this evening? 
The church is the person who's been called out from sin unto Jesus Christ. Uh, so, folks, the reality is this. Calvary Baptist Church is not the church. This is the building. We's the church. Does that make sense? Uh, so, so we understand that in Scripture. We understand the teaching of that. We are the church, those that have been saved and born again. Of course, we often think of the church of this local assembly that we come to we call the church. But we do know in, in our minds that we make up the church. Uh, every person that is saved by the grace of God is a member of the church, if you will. Now, here's what I have found out in my few years on earth, because I'm not very old. In my few years on earth, I have found out this. People are always finding fault with the church. Uh, in fact, there are far too many people pointing out what they think is wrong with the church. Uh, well, here's the thing. Most people haven't figured this out. There is no perfect church. You know why? Because <laughs> we, we's a part of it, right? There are no perfect people, so there can't be a perfect church. There won't be a perfect church till we get to heaven, folks. Uh, it's not going to happen here on earth. And if you found a perfect church, the minute you started attending, guess what? It ain't perfect no more. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so so, so the, the many folks that find fault within the church and like to pick out the problems within the church fail to realize that there is no perfect church. Anytime humans involved in an organization, it's not going to be perfect. But let me say this. I think the problem many times is people are looking for fault within the church. People are looking for fault within the church. Of course, if people look for fault, my, my thought has always been, if you're trying to find problems, number one, you will. Okay? But number two, if you're trying to find problems, you've got a heart issue. Uh, because I'm supposed to love the church. I, I'm supposed to be a part of the church. I'm supposed to serve within the church. I'm supposed to be a part of God's family within the church. And, and so if I'm looking for problems, I have a problem. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, a uh, famous preacher, you probably know the name. Uh, he told a story of an American fruit grower and uh, he was trying to persuade a friend of his to come into his orchard and taste his apples. And the friend just refused to accept the offer. He would not go into the orchard and, and eat these apples. Well, the fruit grower got a little bit offended at his friend, and, and he said, why? This, this really bothers me. Finally, the friend said, you know what? I'll be frank with you. Um, there was the other day I was walking around the wall of your orchard, the outside, and an apple had fallen off your tree. So I picked it up and ate it, and it was the most bitter apple I'd ever tasted. It was disgusting. I don't want to come into your orchard and taste your apples. I know what they taste like. They're horrible. The fruit grower began to chuckle. He said, what are you laughing at? This isn't funny. He said, oh, no, you don't understand. Years ago, I planted around the edge of my property the sour apples to discourage the kids from stealing my fruit. You just happened to get one of the bad fruits. And I tell that to tell you this. You say, why, why are you telling us that story? That makes no sense. Many people today make the same mistake. They judge the church by one bad apple. Huh? How many times have we heard this? Well, I don't go to church because when I was 12, right? Well, I don't go to church because there's this guy I know down the road that goes and he's a big old hypocrite. Well, I don't go to church because I got hurt, you know, 25 years ago. First of all, let me just say this in, in loving kindness and in the grace of Jesus Christ. Get over it. We're humans. We hurt people, unfortunately. You know, that's part of it. But, but we hear this all the time. There's this one thing happened. And what do we do? We hang on to it. And, and this fruit grower laughed. And he said, you know what? And you come to find out when he did come in and taste the apples, he had some of the sweetest apples in the entire region. But don't, don't judge the church by one bad apple. Again, uh, if we look for problems, we're going to find them. If we look for problems, we obviously have our own problems. So tonight, I want to take a few minutes. And instead of talking about what's wrong with the church, I want to talk about what's right with the church. What's right with the church? Uh, again, uh, there are plenty of people looking around to find out what's wrong and needs to be fixed. I want to focus on what's right and why it's right tonight from this passage of Scripture. So let me give you some thoughts tonight. And I think I've got about five, so we'll, go, we'll get through these quickly. And I'll have you out before nine, okay? All right. I'm just kidding. I'm no, just kidding. Number one. Number one. What's right about the church? It has the right creation. It has the right beginning. It has the right start, if you will. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the creation of the church, the founding of the church, the beginning, the starting of the church was started by Christ. Now, I don't know about you, it doesn't get much better than that. 
It doesn't get much better than that. We've seen businesses start and go under. We've seen businesses start and be successful. I'm thankful that God started the church and it has the right creation through Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple thoughts here about this right creation. First of all, it was planned by the Father. It was planned by the Father. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4. According as He has chosen us uh, in Him before the foundation of the world. Before, did you catch that? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Do you realize that God had the foundation in the, in the beginning of the church plan since the beginning of time? Think about that. You know, you think about creation and when God spoke the world into existence. You realize when all that was happening, God already knew there was going to be a church. And God knew that in 2020, there would be a Calvary Baptist church in Benson, Arizona uh, that had a group of people that loved him and wanted to serve him. He knew coronavirus was He knew all that, okay? Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was planned by the Father. Isn't it great when you plan something and it actually works out? You ever plan something and it didn't go as planned? <laughs> it happens all the time, right? God said, hey, here's the plan from the beginning of the world. Here's what's going to happen. And we have what we have today because of that. It was planned by the Father. Secondly, uh, secondly, oh, sorry, I clicked too fast there. Uh, uh, it, was, it was purchased by the Son. It was purchased by the Son. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 again. We just read verse 4. Look at verse 6 and 7. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted. Do you realize this tonight, first of all? Let me, let me, let me take a little parenthesis here. Do you realize that you are accepted no matter what anybody else says? And you're accepted by the one that matters? And it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. We're accepted in the beloved. Look at verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Do you realize the only thing ever purchased by Jesus Christ in all the Bible was the church? If he loved the church enough to die for it, do you think it's pretty important? Amen. I do. I do. So it's planned by the Father. It's purchased by the Son. Look at the third thing. It was processed by the Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all had a part in the creation of the church. Uh, look, look at this thought. Look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. Again, a couple more verses. Look at verse 13 and 14. In whom also, or in whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with what? That Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Think about this tonight. How as a church do we survive? God's in heaven. Uh, the Son has, has ascended to the right hand of the Father. How, how do we make it? How do we survive? He sent us a comforter. He sent us the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God processes the church, if you will. He, he's the one that leads the church. He's the one here now that directs the church. He's the one that takes up residence in our lives and guides us as individual church members. Think about this. The creation of the church was right from the get-go. Planned by the Father, purchased by the Son, processed by the Spirit. What's right with the church? It has the right creation. Look at number two. Number two. It has the right components. It has the right components. You ever tried to put something together with the wrong parts? It doesn't work so well, does it? You ever have a... We're going to show our age here. You remember as a kid, or maybe it was your kids that had it because you were way too old. But you remember that little ball that they used to put in the nursery? It was half red and half blue. had a yellow handle on each end and it had shapes in it. Right? And then it had yellow shapes that you're supposed to fit in the cutout shapes on the ball. You don't know what I'm talking about? I have no clue what it's called. I have no idea. Um, Noah might know. He still has one. But um, I, I can't remember. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I don't remember what it's called. But you remember the, the object of that? What was the object? Put the right shape in the right hole. What happens when you're trying to slam the square into the circle hole? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You ever played the game called Perfection? How many of you know the game Perfection. Only a handful of you. Oh, this is a fun game. We ought to play it on a Sunday sometime. This is great. Uh, you, they've got a, a bunch of pieces, and the shapes are cut out on the board. You push the board down, and it has a timer. And you hear the timer running the whole time. And the object of the thing is to put all the shapes in the cutouts and have it all done before the timer goes. Because when it goes, it goes. And shoots it all over the place. Then you have to have your kids pick them all up. Okay? 
And what I found is this. You get so nervous and you get so hasty and you're, you're, you, that timer starts wearing, you know, and, and you're trying to put the, oh, it's the wrong shape. That's why it doesn't fit. See, see the wrong components don't make for the right product. <laughs> you, ever, you, ever, you ever cook chicken noodle soup? How many of you ever cooked chicken noodle soup? Today, hey, man, do you have any leftovers? I'll be by after church. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. You ever cook chicken noodle soup? Did, did, did you ever put beef in it? Wrong component. Make sense? You all with me, right? The wrong components don't equal for the right product. What's right about the church is this. It's got the right components. Let me give you some scripture. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 25 through 27 real quick. Husbands, we read this earlier. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing uh, of water by the word, that it, he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Look at... Um, Ephesians chapter 1, I didn't give you this verse, so we'll skip, we'll skip it for just a minute. Um, uh, so the right components, who makes up the church? People. The right people. You say, wait a minute, I've seen some pretty bad scoundrels in church. You realize that God brings everybody into the church for a reason? And everybody has a purpose, and everybody has a talent, everybody has a gift, everybody fits into the body and functions in the way they're supposed to. It has the right components. Let me, give you, let me give you the components, okay? First of all, saved sinners. Saved sinners. Do, do you realize what's sitting amongst us tonight? You realize who's talking to you tonight? A saved sinner. A saved sinner. Somebody who has experienced the loving relationship of forgiveness of sins uh, through the Father, Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 here real quick. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, look, at, uh, look at these verses here. I'm going to read. That's 10 verses. But I want to read them real quick. Uh, powerful, powerful verses. Look at Ephesians 2. Verse 1 through 10. And you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You, you see where we're starting here? This is where we all started our lives. We were dead in sin. We were following the leading of the prince of the power of this air, which is who? Satan himself, okay, that was our relationship. Look at verse 3. Among whom also we had a conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, boy, what, what, what a great two words. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together, with Christ. Look at that. Look at the parentheses there. By grace ye are saved. Boy, Paul's throwing out a reminder here to the church at Ephesus. He's really saying, God's quickened us. He's made us alive. He saved us. But you need to remember something. It's because of his grace. It has nothing to do with you. Look at verse number six. And hath raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us, through uh, Christ Jesus. For by grace, we see this again, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What makes up the church? What's the component of the church? Saved sinners. Saved sinners. You realize again, and I know we've already said, there's no perfect people. Uh, it's people who realize, but by the grace of God, that would be me. But by the grace of God, I'd still be wallowing in my own self-pity and in my own sin. I'd still be a slave to Satan. But by the grace of God. What are the components? Saved sinners. Now, I, I don't like this one, but I do like this one. Stumbling saints. Stumbling saints. You say, what in the world do you mean? Well, here's the thing. We're saved sinners, yes, but here's the thing. We still mess up. I, I have people ask this question. You know, I, I got saved. I got born again. I, Christ is now a part of my life. But, man, I sinned yesterday. Am I still saved? Well, according to the Bible, the answer is yes. Amen. Uh, you're still going to sin, but God has forgiven you of that sin. Stumbling st saints. Here's the thing. God does not expect us to be perfect. I don't know about you. I'm thankful for that. 
Because there's no way in the world I'd measure up. <laughs> Stumbling saints. Look at, uh, look at Romans chapter 7 real quick. Uh, Romans chapter 7. We're going to read another, uh, another little passage here uh, just to kind of show you this. Romans chapter 7, and uh, look at verse number 15. We'll read down to verse 25. Again, a little lengthy passage, but I, I want to show you the verses here. Look at verse uh, 25 of Romans chapter 7. I'm sorry, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. That's a little bit wordy, but doesn't that sound like us? The things I want to do, I seem not to do. And the things I shouldn't do, I seem to do. Okay, look for 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh. Listen to this verse. This is, this is a powerful verse. In my flesh dwelleth what? What's the next three words? How many good things? No good things. You, do you realize there are people today that think this? Well, I'm a pretty good person, so I'm all right. I'm going to make it to heaven because my good outweighs my bad. I, I'm a decent, moral person. Do you realize the Bible says in me dwells no good thing? My righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags in God's eyes. In me dwelleth no good thing. Keep reading that verse. Uh, what verse was 18? For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Uh, I find then a law... Uh, that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warning against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this, uh, of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of of sin. That's a, that's a wordy passage. But you know what Paul's saying? I want to do right, but man, I struggle. I know I shouldn't do wrong, and I struggle with that too. He says, I feel like sometimes I'm bound to keep the law, and I keep the law, I'm a pretty good person. But yet I know up here, God says, the law is not what's important. What's important is following me. We're not bound by the law, amen? We're saved by grace. And, and Paul's reminding of this. I'm a wretched man. I wish I would do right more often. Christian, can I just encourage you? You're going to mess up. You're going to stumble along life's journey. As a Christian, you're going to stub your toe and fall down in the race. The encouragement is this. Get back up. Because stumbling saints make up the church. That's part of the component. Saved sinners, stumbling saints... Look at this one, though. Look at letter C. Shining suns. Shining suns. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. 1 John 3, verse 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called, what? The sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and doth not yet appear what we shall be. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You realize that the component of the church, yes, we're saved sinners and stumbling saints, but do you realize that one day we're going to be shining suns? Our testimony is supposed to shine right now. But do you realize what, what we're told here? We're told this. The world's not going to, going to appreciate that. The world's not going to accept it just like they didn't accept Christ. But that doesn't mean I quit. I keep shining. I keep living right. I, I, I keep doing the best that I can in the Christian life. And one day, can you, can you even imagine this? Can you imagine the Bible says that one day we shall be like him? Wow. No more sin. No more imperfections. No more bad attitudes. Amen. All the parents said, <laughs> amen. Amen. Uh, no more imperfections, no more unrighteousness, no more struggles with sin, a perfect body. You realize in heaven we're going to have a perfect body? Do you, understand? Do you grasp that? A perfect body in heaven. Everybody's going to look just like me. 
I'm kidding. I'm far from perfect there, but think about it. One day, we're going to be like him. That's the component of the church now. What, a, what, a, what an awesome thing we have to look forward to. Amen? Amen. Uh, it has the right components. Number three. Number three. Let me hurry here. It has the right communication. It has the right communication. Let me read you a scripture here, and then I'll, I'll talk about this here in just a minute. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. For it I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is that? What does that verse comp uh, c c compile? What does it give us today? The gospel. Somebody said it. The gospel. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. You realize as a church, that's our communication. Now let me pause for just a minute and explain here, okay? You, you ever, and again... This passage is, is correlating the relationship with the church in Christ to the relationship of husband and wife. Now, without testifying tonight, when, ladies, ladies, without, without testifying too much, okay? Would you agree that many times in a marriage relationship, one of the biggest problems besides money, I know that's the biggest cause of divorce if you want to study the money, but you, would you agree tonight that one of the biggest problems we have in our marital relationships is communication? If you think about it, every problem could be solved probably better if we communicated better. Y'all, I'm guilty. You can ask my wife. She'll be like, yeah. <laughs> By the way, you've probably asked me a question, asked my wife the question. We gave you two different answers because we hadn't communicated. Right? Communication's huge. Here's the thing about the church being right. Our communication is not, well, the pastor says... Our communication is not, well, the, 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 uh, uh, the constitution of the church says. Our communication is not, well, through the, through the last 15 years we've passed down these traditions. Our communication is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't go wrong with the gospel. Uh, it's the right communication. Let me give you a couple things about this communication. First of all, first of all it's a powerful communication. You realize how powerful the gospel is this morning or this evening, whatever time of day it is? It's, it's powerful. Look at Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation. To how many people? Everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's a powerful communication. What saves souls today? It's not the church, friends. It's not my eloquent speaking ability, which I don't have. Amen. It's not my good looks, which I do have, but don't really matter. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just teasing. It's the gospel. Nobody can be saved without the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection has to be believed and applied for salvation to happen. It's a powerful communication. But I like this as well. It's a, it's a pleasant communication. It's a pleasant communication. You say, well, how is death pleasant? Well, let me show you the pleasant aspect of this. Look at two verses. Look at Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's whosoever mean? Anybody? Uh, the richest man in the world? Yeah. The poorest person in the world? Yeah. The, uh, the tallest, the shortest, the fattest, the thinnest? The ugliest, the prettiest, you fill in the blank. The, uh, the, the, the wealthiest, you know, it doesn't matter. The, the high society, the lowest, it doesn't matter. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Now I want to show you another important word. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what's the next word? Shall be saved. What's the word shall mean? Will. It's going to happen. No questions asked. Take it to the bank. The fat lady has sung. <laughs> Every time I used to say that, whenever I'd preach, my mom was around. She's like, that's not nice. You shouldn't say things like that, Danny. <laughs> shut up, mom. No, I didn't say it. Shut up, mom. I said, yes, ma'am. I'll never say it again. Don't tell her I said it, okay? Hopefully she doesn't watch tonight. But uh, <laughs> take it to the bank. God says this. You talk about a pleasant communication. If you trust in the gospel, and if you call him, you shall be saved. Look at John 3, 16. We all know it, but I put it up there for you anyways. For God so loved the world. Who's, in, who's included in the world? I, for one, uh, red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. Amen. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. I don't know about you. That's pretty pleasant, isn't it? To be able to share with somebody a very simple truth. If you trust Jesus, you'll have everlasting life. If you trust Christ, you'll have an eternal home in heaven. That's pretty pleasant, isn't it? Especially in the midst of all that we're going through in our world today. All the problems, all the, all the division, all the hatred, all that stuff. To say, be able to say, the gospel will set you free. The gospel will give you a home in heaven. That's pretty pleasant. That's powerful. Let me give you this. The third thing is this. It's a perfect communication the church has. It's a perfect communication. Why is it perfect? Because it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with us. Look at John chapter 6, verse 37. John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, look at the last part of that verse, I will in no wise cast out. You talk about a perfect gospel. Anybody who comes can be accepted. Look at, look at uh, Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. Another familiar verse we probably all know. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You realize there's no room for error in there? There's no gray area. It's black and white, 100%. You, you trust Christ, you believe in him, you call upon him, you, you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you shall be saved. It's perfect. That There's no room for error. That's the communication of the church. Listen, friend, when, when, when people like to say this about the church, well, there's hypocrites in there. A, they're right, there are. B, they should join us because they are too, amen. And C, it's not about us. It's about the powerful communication we have, which is the gospel, which is perfect. It's perfect. It's powerful. It's pleasant. We have the right communication. Number four, let me give you this about the church and what's right about it. We have the right challenge. We have the right challenge. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 uh, through 16. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for what? Nothing. Doth he cast out and be trotted under foot of man? Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so therefore so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Uh, the, uh, the right challenge. What's our challenge? To be the salt and the light of the world. You ever, you ever been challenged to do something? I get asked to do a lot of things, and some things I'm able to do, and some things I'm not able to do, whether time or ability, whatever it may be. But when somebody says this, I dare you, guess what? It's going to happen. It's on. It's on like Donkey Kong, amen? <laughs> you challenge me? It's going to happen. You say, well, I'm good at this sport. I challenge you. Oh, it's on. I may never have played that sport before, but I'm going to learn it. I'm going to get I'm going to cheat if I have to, and I'm going to beat you. I don't like to lose, Amen. You know what somebody is who likes to lose? A loser. <laughs> Nobody likes to lose. Give me a challenge. It's going to happen. It, it, again, I may not succeed and I may fail, but I'm going to give it my all. Uh, I love a good challenge. You love a good challenge? Jo uh, John, you were walking out this morning, and we were just kind of chatting over, you know, as you were walking out, and Johnny was talking about giving a boxing match with his dad. And I said, I want to see it. I'll pay money to see this. This is going to be good. <laughs> I never challenged my dad to a fight. My dad would have whooped me up one side, back down the other, and into, the, into tomorrow. I mean, I just wouldn't have done it. Okay? I never dreamed of it. I don't challenge my mom either. She's pretty mean. But uh, anyways, <laughs> my kids every now and then, Noah or Danny would look at me, and they'd get a little mouthy, a little lippy, and I'd just tell them this. When you feel froggy, you go ahead and jump. It ain't going to be pleasant. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we, don't like a we, 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 we don't like to be challenged and not be able to come up with the, with the victory. Uh, a good challenge. You realize this, the church has the right challenge. And it has nothing to do with fighting. It has everything with do, being what we should be, the salt and light of the earth. Look, look at the challenge of the church. Okay, Let me get a little bit more specific. The first challenge we see given to us in Scripture for the church is to edify the saints. What does the word edify mean? Teach? Build up? What's that? Somebody yelled another one. 
Somebody else say one? Build up, encourage. All right. The challenge we're given as a body of believers, as, a, uh, as Christians within the church, we're given the challenge to edify the saints. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Look at Ephesians 4.12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know what the challenge given to the church is? Build one another up. Encourage other Christians. You realize today as a church body, it's not about me. And it's not about you. It's all about him. But how do we accomplish all about him? By investing in us. My goal as a Christian should never be to, well, I want to make sure that I have a better Christian status than the guy sitting next to me. My goal should be this. I want to lift you up, brother. I want to encourage you. If you've fallen, I want to lend you a hand and help you back up. If you're discouraged, I want to encourage you. If you're feeling loved, I want to love you. If you need help, I want to be there. If you've got a burden, I want to help you bear it. The edification of the saints is the challenge given to the church, and it's the right challenge. Because here's the thing. The world's not going to love you. The world's not going to... Have you ever noticed this when the world gets you in trouble, they're not there to get you out? You ever notice that? (laughs) <laughs> when the world gets you into problems, they're not there to help you with the problems. They take off the other way. We are encouraged in Scripture. We're given this challenge. Edify the saints. We, we have a second challenge in Scripture. Exalt the Savior. Exalt the Savior. Again, it's not about me. It's about Him. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat. Oh, I like that. Amen. Or drink. Amen. Whatsoever ye do, do all. Why, what, what, for what purpose? To the glory of God. You realize when you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth, it's for the glory of God. Especially if you're coming to church, amen? It helps us a little bit too, but it's for the glory of God. Amen? Everything you do. When you, when you pick up trash, it's for the glory of God. Uh, when, you, when you love your neighbor, it's for the glory of God. Uh, when, when, you, when you treat your children properly, it's for the glory of Everything we do is for the glory of God. We are encouraged in Scripture. The challenge that we have is to edify the saints. It's also to exalt the Savior. Look at Colossians 1.18. Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. What's preeminence mean? The glory. First place, numero uno. Number one. Head, top. Nothing held back. We are challenged as a church, yes, to edify one another, but then we're also challenged to exalt Jesus Christ. Should not everything we do as a Christian point people to Jesus? I know we invite people to church, and that's great. You know, we should. Amen? Thank you, John. Amen! (laughs) We ought to invite people to church. I mean, we should, right? But the whole importance of inviting them to church is to further than invite them to the Savior. Exalt the Savior. Magnify Christ. Lift him up. We don't worship the church. We don't worship, at least I hope not, the pastor. Amen? Somebody should say amen right there. Amen. We worship Jesus Christ. And our challenge as a church is to edify one another. And then it's to exalt the Savior. Number three, we have a third challenge. We talked about this this morning. To evangelize the sinner. To evangelize the sinner. We have some clear scripture that point to this. Mark 16, 15, very simple verse. You probably all know it. And he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to who you feel like. To those that make you happy. To those you fit in with. To those that look like you. To those that meet your check out of the box. No, it says to every creature. You know, you can ask my family this and my kids will testify of this and they'll tell you how upset they get with me sometimes. I'll talk to a doorknob for a long time. I have no problems communicating with people, okay? I talk for a living. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Some of you wish I'd shut up. I know. <laughs> uh, but, but here's the thing. It's great to be able to talk to every creature. But what am I supposed to do? Preach the gospel to every creature. That's the challenge I've been given. Edify the saints. Exalt the Savior. Evangelize the sinner. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Another verse you probably all know. But ye shall receive power... That's from on high. That's the Holy Spirit power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be, what? Witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uh, and the uttermost parts of the earth. 
my challenge to the church, God's challenge to the church that's been given to me, is to evangelize the sinner. These are some pretty good challenges. Edify one another. Encourage the saints. Exalt the Savior. And evangelize the sinner. Let me give you this last thing. Number five, what's right with the church? I like this one. It's got the right conclusion. It's got the right conclusion. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. That he might present to himself, we read this earlier, a glorious church. Oh, look at this. No spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. Now let me ask you a quick question. For God to present himself that type of church, when will that take place? When we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. Why? We'll finally have a perfect church. The, the right conclusion. What's, what's a conclusion? It's the end. It's the finish. It's the completion. Here's the thing about the church. Here's what's right about it. We've got the right finish. Do we always start right in, in, in life? No. But again, that's the past. What's, what, what, what truly matters is how we finish. The church has the right conclusion. Look at a couple thoughts about the conclusion of the church. First of all, look at the blessing of our hope. The blessing of our hope. Let me give you some scripture here. We'll read through these real quick. Titus 2.13. Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 says this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. That's the best verse you'll find in the Bible for the nursery. We shall not all sleep. <laughs> we shall be changed. Amen? Amen. <laughs> in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That's our blessed hope. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18. But I will not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Uh, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Amen. With the voice of, the, of God, of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Look at the last verse. We skip this one a lot. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. The blessing of our hope. Here, here's our hope. And by the way, when we say hope, we're not, oh, I wish I'd get a bite for Christmas. That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about a hope. It's a, it's a solidified fact. We know this is going to happen, and I can't wait for it. That's our blessed hope. What is it? That we shall be changed. We shall have a home in heaven for eternity. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we'll meet them in the air. Why the dead in Christ rise first? <laughs> Anybody have a theological answer? Here's my theological answer for you. This is deep. You ready? I'm going to knock your socks off. They've got six feet farther to travel. Huh? You can get a PhD for that, right? <laughs> Uh, they've got to break the grave open and come out of it. And, and they're going to rise when that trumpet... Can you, can you even imagine the day that trumpet sounds? You talk about a blessed hope. That eastern sky is going to split wide open. We're going to hear the voice there. By the way, I'm going to just say this right now. I think Gabriel's warming up that trumpet now. I don't think it's going to be too, too much longer before we hear that sound of the trumpet. And, and our, our relatives are going to... Their bodies are going to come out of the grave. Our loved ones that know Christ, they're going to ascend to heaven. We're going to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a great hope, friends. The blessing of our hope. But look at this. Look at the blessing of our home. What's the conclusion for the church? We're going to leave this old sinful world, and guess where we're heading? Home. To a place called heaven. Look at John chapter 14. You know these verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, there's that word will again, come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What a blessed conclusion. Our home in heaven. Look at Revelation 21, verse 4. Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears 
from their eyes. Amen. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. You talk about the blessing of our home. Think about it tonight. We're going to a place with no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more medical issues, no more burdens, uh, no more crying, no more tears, no more loss. No more. No more. That's the blessing of our home. We have the right conclusion. Friends, tonight I just want to say this. There's, there, there, there's too much right with the church for people to look for fault in what's wrong with the church. Uh, if we look for fault, we need to look within our own heart first. Uh, the church is too valuable to allow a few disgruntled whiners, amen, <laughs> to tear her apart because they want to look for fault. When someone has a problem with the church, let me put it this way. When someone has a problem with the church, they have a problem with me because I love the church. Amen. By the way, that ought to be your feeling too. If somebody wants to find fault, that's a, that's a problem with me because I make up that church. There's going to be problems, but I ought not to look for them. Folks, the, the, the business of the church is much bigger than you and I. Don't allow somebody to tear it up for their own cause. Instead of finding fault with the church, let's, let's rejoice about what's right with the church. Let's thank God that he's blessed us with the church that's alive this morning, this evening, whatever time of day it is. Amen. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm still getting used to the time adjustments. <laughs> hey, think about it. I'm thankful we're alive today. You, you, you know, there's a lot of churches today that haven't seen somebody saved in 15 years. Amen. I, I, I don't know if I shared it with you or not. Most of you maybe not even know, but uh, we had just, uh, just, just two weeks ago after the service, we had a teenage boy saved. Trust Christ, gave his heart to Christ. Uh, there, there's churches today that they, 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 they never hear an amen, a hallelujah, a praise King Jesus. There's never a hand raise. There's never even a grunt. Oh, my. Oh, me. <laughs> huh? There's churches today. They never invite anybody to come. There's never a visitor that darkens their doors. I'm thankful we have a church that's, a, that's living today. Amen? Uh, a church that has a little bit of excitement about it. You know, here, 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 this is great encouragement to the pastor. You have young families that are excited. But it's awesome to see, don't take this the wrong way, it's awesome to see old people excited. You didn't take that wrong, did you, Mary? You're okay? You're okay with me saying that? All right. It's good to see senior saints that are still excited. I'm thankful for the church tonight. There's so much right about it. I want to focus on the right and not the wrong. I want to focus on what's right with the church. The right creation, the right components, the right communication, the right challenge, the right conclusion. And tonight, I pray you can take home tonight and think about this. I'm thankful I'm part of a church, and it's right. Because we have what's right. Let's focus on what's right with the church. Is there going to be problems? Sure. Can we handle them? Oh, yeah. Because there's a lot of right going on. And I'm thankful for what God has given us in the church tonight. What's right with the church? Let's focus on that. And when the naysayers come, the complainers and the gripers come, let's say, hey, look, look at what's right. It far outweighs that which is wrong. What's right with the church? Father, Lord, tonight I pray you'll take the thoughts that have been shared this evening. I pray you'll use them in our hearts and in our lives. Strengthen us, encourage us, edify us, grow us, challenge us uh, through the message tonight. Uh, Lord, may we be thankful for what is right with the church. And Lord, I know there's problems. We're, we're not perfect people. I know problems will come. There'll be issues we have to face. I understand all that, as do this, does the church body. But Lord, help us to focus our attention, not on the negative and not on the wrong, but help us to focus on what's right. And Lord, may we be able to present this right communication with the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, I pray. Father, we ask you now tonight as we get ready to go home, we pray that you will dismiss us safely. Uh, Lord, bring us back again on Wednesday as we uh, meet together, we sing, we fellowship, we open your word and, and study the Bible on Wednesday. Uh, just bring us back, we pray. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Right before we go, if you need to slip out, you can. But right before we go, uh, I would like to do this. If you weren't aware of this, one of our uh, church members uh, usually sits right over here behind uh, where Lynn's sitting there. Uh,